the trans industry with Femingo, Golden, Buchanan, and Loffendale. Men are good, as are you. Indeed, men are good, as are you, and as is Janice Fiamingo. And here, the four of us are gathered once again, and I want to introduce you quickly to each of them. Mike Buchanan is uh, the co-founder of the ICMIs and is the founder of the Justice for Boys and Men Party, which I think, Mike, is the only party in the world that stands up for boys and men. Is that right? The only Since we launched in 2013, Tom, the only party campaigning for the human rights of men and boys in the English-speaking world, and the only avowedly anti-feminist political party in the English-speaking world. Bravo to both. And Don Loffendale is with us, and Don is a frequent uh, presenter at the ICMIs, whom we love dearly. He's always got some interesting perspectives on things. He's a lawyer from Canada. And we have Janice Fiamingo, of course, the creator of the Fiamingo File 1 and Fiamingo File 2, which I would highly recommend you have a look at because it is fascinating. Anyway, and as always, Janice has a perspective that most of us haven't really thought of yet. So go see her Fiamingo Files. And I'm Tom Golden, and I'm at mentorgood.locals.com. And yeah, most of my material is there now. It's not on YouTube. It's not on the web anymore. It's only on local. So come see me there. Today, we're going to talk about the trans industry. Hmm. Janice, can you get us started? Yes. Thank you, Tom. The trans industry. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, there are various movements in the uh, 20th and early 20th centuries, various social movements, um, that feminism has managed to incorporate and take under its wing. If we could think about the uh, environmentalist movement, we could think huh. about the uh, gay rights movement, the disability movement, um, uh, anti-racism, anti-colonialism, hmm. all of those feminism has managed to, you could say, colonize and has turned into a, an arm of the feminist movement. Huh. The one movement that it may be true that feminism hasn't quite managed to take control over is the trans movement, although it is intimately related to feminism. It's the one movement that I think has managed to push feminism back on its heels. And so we are now witnessing an interesting phenomenon whereby feminists themselves are finding themselves in the position of being censored on the big tech platforms being in some cases actually charged with hate speech for stating biological facts about men and women mm -hmm. and finding themselves charged with, in general terms, being exclusionary and um, you know, not <laughs> caring about equality. Uh, it, the very same kinds of charges that many feminists have brought against men when they tried to state biological facts or protect their own spaces, feminists themselves now are, are having to experience this very unpleasant kind of um, mobbing. So that's an interesting factor. And um, I think one of the things about the trans movement that has been so interesting, and we're a course, especially interested in it as it affects men and boys and as it exposes elements of feminist ideology. I think one of the things that's most interesting is that the, the trans ideology in which one's felt uh, experience of gender uh, trumps biological reality. Hmm. The trans movement has exposed the internal incoherencies and falsehoods of feminist ideology. And it has also exposed the double standards of feminist ideology. Mm -hmm. So I hope we can talk about some of these, these issues today. Um, I guess I would want to start by saying that um, what has struck me most powerfully over the last couple of years, as there has developed a decided split within the feminist movement between uh, those feminists who are very supportive of trans ideology, who claim that trans women are women uh, and who have 
simply broaden the feminist umbrella to include trans women, that is men who are transitioning or have transitioned into women. Um, there are those feminists and there are also um, TERFs, trans exclusionary feminists, or sometimes they call themselves gender critical feminists who reject these, these people and who are very, very angry and upset sometimes framing the issue as a patriarchal takeover of women's bodies and women's spaces. One of the things that I find most interesting about the debate is the fact that the latter category of feminists, those who protest the danger to women and the usurpation of women's bodies by men, that they are quite blind to the fact that feminist theory itself is absolutely bedrock and fundamental to trans ideology. If it hadn't been for absolutely decades of feminist theory claiming that gender is a social construct, that pretty well <laughs> everything that matters about male-female differences is actually produced through social conditioning. Without that, it would have been impossible to imagine the trans movement as it looks today. And yet that is something that is persistently denied by these feminist critics of trans who keep claiming that this is merely an ingenious way, the latest way that men have found to colonize women and to continue to exert control and terrorize women. So I think that's that's quite interesting in itself. And, yes, and it uh, anyone, anyone who doesn't um, realize the extent to which this is true should take a look at some of the founders of second wave feminism, such as Kate Millett. I mean, this goes even further back to Simone de Beauvoir and her 1949 tract. Um, the second sex in which she has you know, a, a, an entire segment of the book claiming that social conditioning is all one is not born, but rather becomes woman, that everything that happens to a girl from the earliest experiences to uh, right up until womanhood conditions her to accept her inferiority, both physically and emotionally and psychologically. If you look at Kate Millett's 1970 book, Sexual Politics, she deals extensively with the idea that um, you know, gender is primarily a product of, of social forces that train up a girl to accept her inferiority. And, and, you know, and that was the standard line of feminism for decades. Yes. And so when we now get to this point to hear feminists saying that there is a biological difference that needs to be recognized <laughs> between the two sexes and that not to recognize it actually does harm to women and girls, the irony is quite tremendous. So there's Massive. a certain satisfaction in you know witnessing that. Unfortunately, the, the damage to truth and to common sense social norms that the trans phenomenon, or at least the extreme end of the trans phenomenon, does takes away the satisfaction of you yes. know witnessing the the um, the hypocrisy of, of feminism being exposed. Mm -hmm. So I guess that that would be my opening statement. Boy, we could stop I, right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, they're still focused on everything is socially constructed. You know, that's, they still keep that up, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know. And it's amazing the the book that you showed me the other day, Janice, about the uh, the girls and sports, and how the whole thing was constructed. You know that if only girls had had the same kind of social upbringing boys had, they'd be able to do just as well. In fact, maybe be better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh yes. my gosh! Yeah, that that was a standard um series of propositions by feminism up until very recently um there's a that's a 2011 book there's a huh. chapter called the socially constructed body um by by huh. these two sociologists uh they make that claim extensively quoting from many other scholars that from the time that they are very young girls learn to move differently a girl is taught through 
told that she throws like a girl and therefore she learns to throw like a girl, allegedly. Girls aren't encouraged, allegedly, by their parents and by those around them to move in the same way that boys are. They're not encouraged to be aggressive in the same way that boys are. So although they, they, they admit that there are some biological sex differences, they see the primary difference is that girls are simply not encouraged to be as, as, as athletic, as in their bodies, as men are. And this yeah. is still a line taken by, uh, there's a, a professor of um, uh, sport, at, I think Purdue University, uh, her, her, her name is actually Cookie or Cookie, C-O-O-K-Y. <laughs> oh, like Cookie. Uh, and, and she, <laughs> she uh, makes the same kinds of claims um, that, that essentially the idea that women are weaker than men is an idea that's been used to subordinate women, including women's sports. Yes. And she, she, she argues that even in the way um, male female sports are covered, that, 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 uh, that often, uh, for example, sports uh, commentators are less enthusiastic about women's sports. And they, they give it a less serious treatment. They tend to focus on women's attractiveness rather than on women's <laughs> strength and power. Wonder and, why. And elaborate arguments about all the ways in which uh, female sports uh, are denigrated by sports analysts and commentators. And that that is the reason why women can't actually compete on a level playing field with, with male athletes. And that if only the coverage changed that, you know, the, the sports teams would perform differently. It yes. is quite remarkable. Yes. And, and she, you <laughs> know, she, this, this woman has spent her career making those kinds of arguments yep. and it isn't clear at all then why there should even be a separate sports category for women at all. If that's her belief, why not just open it up and have all 32 of the genders competing, you know, together and, and therefore there would be no more discrimination. Like uh, she that. is actually a, a proponent of the trans phenomenon. She, she welcomes huh. um, athletes like Leah Thomas in swimming. There's, you know, Emily Bridges in cycling. There's Fallon Fox in mixed martial arts. There's um, Castor Semenya in middle distance running. She accepts all these athletes as, um, as she sees them as striking a blow against the idea that women are weaker than, than men biologically. So she is a, a champion of the the trans movement, but Indeed. of course many other feminists are not. Yes. Yeah. So so interesting fault lines are certainly um, being exposed in in feminist theory. Yes, and the quotes that we put up while Janice was talking were of the book that she was talking about. And I, I want to go back to this one just to see the very last line. The result is that even women's championship teams falter and fail. <laughs> So the whole yeah. paragraph is talking about how, you know, they you know they they don't get the same media coverage. They don't get this. They don't get encouraged. Believing is seeing, and then they say that's why they fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like oh my gosh, wow. oh yeah. just crazy stuff. Yeah, it is, and and that and that has been like you know that that was a a chapter in a college textbook. <laughs> has been used in sociology courses across North America. Oh, man. That, that has been the standard, allegedly the scientific line about gender that <laughs> has been pumped out of universities for decades. So yes. It's no wonder that so many people um, believe it. Yes. And that yeah. same book talks about throwing like a girl. You know, they were taught that they throw like a girl, so they didn't throw in the same way. But if you look at someone like David Geary, who wrote the male-female sex differences between men and women. Look at what Geary says. By two to four years of age, more than nine out of ten boys can throw farther than the average girl. And by 17 years, only the most skilled girls can throw as far as the least skilled boys. Hmm. And he, just, he goes on to talk about the differences are in the forearm that men have longer ulnas and radii, and that gives them a higher capacity to be able to throw quickly and accurately. So, 
It's like all kinds of biological things are going on that they just completely miss. You know, they just completely, just everything's constructed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a uh, woman by the name of Alice Rossi who, who was a early 70s kind of stereotypical angry feminist. I read uh, some of her stuff. But she had some intellectual honesty to her. She was no Janice Fiamingo, but she had something. And in, uh, I recall it was a publication called um, Diadlas. In spring of 77, she wrote an article, not exactly recanting what she had said before, but sounding, frankly, much more rational and calm. And she entitled this article, The Missing Body in Sociology. So this is exactly along the lines of what Geary is saying now. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I didn't follow her specifically, but I think she lost a lot of sway after that article. Uh -huh. But here was someone who made an attempt to improve on her original view and uh but got absolutely absolutely nowhere with it yeah yeah hmm. i wonder i wonder is it perhaps time tom to talk about the history of transgenderism sure right which is something that that really fascinates me and it's it's uh it's 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 relationship to to feminism i mean here uh, um here in the uk possibly the best known uh transgender person in my lifetime and i'm 64 um is is uh, the author jan morris mm -hmm. um who transitioned from james morris uh had had surgery in morocco in um in uh, 1972 i think so uh 50 years ago um and it seems that you know society however nebulous that is has trundled on accepting that some people you know a small minority of people feel that they're if, if you like the opposite sex to their assigned birth, if we can use that that expression, um, um, and and it's only really in recent years that uh, that the, 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 there's been much uh, societal concern. I mean, for most of the last fifty years, the majority of uh, of, of uh, transgendered people, or pe people undergoing surgery in particular, have been men. Um, right. And 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 right. it seems that there was never much societal concern about men having their genitals removed. Um, <laughs> the I mean, a, a very interesting phenomenon in recent years is that uh, the, the 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 majority of <clears throat> of transgenders, uh, certainly in terms of of, of uh, reconstruction surgery, have been female. Um, right. And uh, right. I think in, in in one of your articles, Janice, you you say that. You, you, you point to a psychology magazine which says that, 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 that today something over 80% of new transgender people are women. And um, I, 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 um, I believe that this, this, is, this is mainly due to a phenomenon that um, Charles Murray in uh, Human Diversity um, calls rapid onset gender dysphoria. And he starts with this. This is a newly documented phenomenon that might not even have existed a decade ago is characterized by adolescents, mostly female, who show no signs of gender dysphoria as children and, and apparently abruptly decide they are transgender as teenagers, um, which is a really quite extraordinary thing. And, and he yes. goes on to, to, to say that 83% um, of people in this category are female. So, 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 so this is mainly teenage girls, and I think Jordan Peterson has talked, talked about social contagion, and he describes the social media. They they get together in groups, um, and 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 rapidly self-identify as tra mm -hmm. transgender, and it's 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 really it's it's an extraordinary example of the of the empathy gap. I think that 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 and, and again, your, your your latest article, Janice, really describes this very very well. That, that, that there's there's empathy for and quite rightly for girls who may unnecessarily be having surgery as young as 16. Um, there's never been, to my knowledge, any any sympathy for for for, for boys um, and, and 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 men who have their genitals removed. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's something wrong with them. Indeed, and, and they're often presented <laughs> as 
of course, as trans women, as as a threat. Yes. To, right. To, to, exactly. To yes. yes. Yeah, that's the only way they've ever been um, presented as far as I'm aware. There's never been any discussion of why is it that a uh, perfectly healthy man might decide to become a woman. And I'm not claiming any expertise on this, but um, certainly if we're talking about young people, it would not be at all surprising to me that the enormous anti-male animus in our culture would have something to do with it. If you hear from the time you're a very, very young boy that the future is female and that men are responsible for all the evils of the world and all the different slogans that we now have pouring out from popular culture about the superiority, the superior empathy, the superior intelligence, the superior leadership qualities of females, uh, it wouldn't be surprising if that would play some role in a young man's decision that he would prefer to be a woman. But that there's never been any discussion of that. Trans women have always been looked at only through the lens of threat to women. Right. And right. yes, it's just so remarkable that now when it seems that at least at the adolescent stage, a great number of those transitioning are actually girls transitioning to boys. It's suddenly there are all this discussion and great empathy and concern about the decision. And I heard a discussion not too long ago. Um, well, actually, the discussion is is from a couple of years ago, but the, it, it was a video that I just discovered recently between Candace Owens and a woman named Abigail Schreier, who has written a book on the subject specifically of of teen girls transitioning to to um, to book to become boys, and yeah, there was a great deal of concern that this was because allegedly society wasn't affirming enough of femininity, that girls weren't being told that it was great to be a girl, it was great to have breasts, it was great to have the opportunity to become a mother, you know, there were all these biological realities that deserve to be celebrated, but somehow weren't being celebrated in our culture. And they even evoked that idea that this was a return of the patriarchy, a triumph of the patriarchy, rolling back the gains that women had made because women weren't being affirmed in their femaleness. And also, of course, there was the threat narrative uh, about the other side, that these girls were at the same time not being protected from those boys who are often referred to as men, not as boys, mm -hmm. who were transitioning to femaleness and then taking over their spaces and you know ruining their sports and, and taking over uh, femalehood altogether. So yeah, the, the, um, the determination always to see anything that men decide to do in terms of something that is aggressive, something that's predatory and dangerous, and always to understand anything that females do as something that results from their victimization, deserving of great concern and compassion, is really on full display when it comes to, it seems, almost all aspects of the, uh, of the trans issue. And isn't, isn't it an astonishing angle that girl, the, the, the claim that girls have not been told that it's great being a girl? I mean, they've heard yeah. nothing yeah. else. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. What, what I don't understand is, okay, they're talking about the future is female. Why would any girl want to be a boy? Why would any girl want to be a man? I mean, men are toxic, right? Men are terrible. Yes. Men are this. Why, are, why is this rush to be masculine? I don't get it. I, I think, he, he, I think it had... the... Sorry, Jonas. Oh, well, you go ahead, Mike, if you want. No, I was just going to say, the, the other side of the coin, of course, is that... Um, is that boys have heard nothing but how they're toxic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they, they get the messages yeah. all the time. They, they, yeah. they, they go exactly. to schools where almost all the teachers are, uh, are women. Um, and um, I think also in your article, Janice, you pointed that there's, there's been quite a spike in teenage boys' suicides. Yes. And I'd be surprised if the transgenderism, transgenderism issue hadn't been a contributor to, to that. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, you know, I think actually feminist theory, which has become more and more warped and bizarre as it's become more and more intersectional over the last couple of decades, I think it has a role to play in both 
female to male transgenderism and male to female transgenderism. It makes sense to us to see it in terms of male to female transgenderism, yes. because we've been very much aware of that whole narrative about how boys are no good. They are toxic. They need to step, take a step back. They, they need to step away from the power. They need to vote feminist women into positions of, of power. You know, they, they, they need to essentially just should sit down and shut up and let their far superior sisters take over. But I think what we don't talk about so much and maybe even don't pay so much attention to is the fact that even within feminist theory and its celebration of the marginalized and the oppressed, what they now call cisgender femaleness is inferior to other oppressed identities. Hmm. and there has been a great deal of talk about the intersectionality of oppression and how the preferred identities are those that can, can that can claim more characteristics of oppression so if you are a black woman that is far more interesting oh, and morally authentic than being a right. white woman because right. if you're a white woman you have to apologize for your white skin privilege if you're a lesbian you are morally more authentic and deserve to be listened to and empathized with more than if you're a heterosexual female. And trans is also an identity that has that kind of um, moral cachet. And so a lot of, especially I think, white girls are feeling the heat of that. And teenage girls of, of anyone are especially sensitive to these kinds of um, calibrations of status yes, and, and, you know, moral status that feminism is all about. It's all about who is most oppressed and therefore can speak the loudest and claim the most attention right. and moral authority. And a cisgender girl doesn't have as much moral authority as a trans, as a trans right. person. Right. It's a good point. So, so again, that I think this drive to claim an oppressed identity plays mm. a great role in why a lot of these girls are feeling uncomfortable in themselves. They're being asked to take on all the burden of guilt. It may, may be the burden of guilt of whiteness, of their, their cisgender identity, of their heterosexuality. All of those are now stigmatized according to feminist theory. They're things that one must apologize for. So I can well understand why some of these teenage girls want to escape all of that and into an identity that is perceived as morally pristine. Yeah, yeah. And it's, highly it's valued. A really, yes, highly valued. It's a yeah. really sick, yeah. I mean, that is, really and we've is. seen this from the male side, but this is happening on the female side too. It is yeah. a really sick ideology that elevates oppression to some kind of superior moral status. And so everybody wants to be able to claim that because it means you don't have to take on the burden of collective guilt that feminist ideology is all about. And, 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 so and like, oddly enough, like boys oh, have suffered from this for years. And we, yep. you know, we, yep. we've been yep. following that. But I think in, in a way, oh, boy. guys are better at handling it, like guys, you know, and we've seen this even in these studies of the fact that a lot of men and boys are still kind of, I mean, obviously there are many men and boys suffering, but um, like men and boys, they still have a sense of what it means to be themselves. They are to some extent able to shrug off some of the horrific huh. toxic propaganda that they hear huh. i think teenage girls are uniquely vulnerable to it hmm. and and they're now finding themselves the target of similar kind of toxic right. ideology and right. so they're trying to escape it in 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 this manner yeah and it's a new thing for them whereas boys it's mm -hmm. been there for yeah. know, their entire lives yeah That's yeah a good point if, if I might, I have uh, two points to make. Uh, one is to uh, pick up on uh, Janice's comment about while well, a lot of men and boys are suffering lots of suicide and depression and things like that, that a number, a significant number of men and boys have been able to 
if not entirely thrive, uh, healthily survive and develop. And one example of that, to my mind, is the yes study that has demonstrated that since at least the 1970s, some suggestions since the 1950s, uh, there's been uh, and uh, the uh, happiness change forms an X with uh, females being happiest in the 50s and going downhill today, notwithstanding the tremendous gains and men being less happy then in the sort of the 50s to 70s and getting like nothing but happier. And it was Steve Brule, I believe, uh, who pointed out that, well, one of the big things going on in that time is less marriage. And, you know, the supposedly <laughs> oppressive marriage, bad deal for women, great deal for men, as that has faltered, women have become kind of miserable and men have gotten happier. And, you know, like just that fact alone ought to make us kind of rethink. Pause. You know, right? Like, yeah, pause as to how things yeah. really were. Uh, uh, the other point I wanted to make you huh. guys were uh, talking about things like the empathy gap, uh, double standards, stereotyping, or, or rather uh, the specific example was male to female trans. Uh, transition nobody really cared if guys got their genitals chopped off but if there is a concern it's that these guys are uh, predatory and the thing that um, occurred to me a while back is that the feminist fabrication of the largely mythical um, oppressive patriarchy leads to constant stereotyping and t double standards those two things are allowed or encouraged um validated by that myth because that's always the answer right o uh, oppressive yeah. uh patriarchy huh. mm -hmm. i i would say hatred too overt expressions of hatred uh, certainly in the last couple of decades, Steve was just, Steve Brule, we just mentioned, uh, he was talking about this just the other day, that uh, like they don't, they don't even try to, I would say many feminists and even many women actually now feel that they've been given a license to hate. Um, and right. they don't even feel the need to hide it anymore. They used to say, oh, no, we don't hate men. Uh, and then they said, oh, we don't hate men, but it wouldn't matter if we did. And now they just come right out and say, yeah, we do hate men and we have every right to do so. Why can't we and, hate men? Uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's another yeah. one of the, the, the delicious ironies of the trans movement and its determination to censor gender critical or turf feminists uh, is that after saying <laughs> that, you know, for so long, they, they, they felt that they had every right to be hateful and now surprise surprise they're being told that they're hateful uh, merely for saying that a man cannot be a woman and and vice versa so yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, exactly if i might uh, uh validate that perception or the, your view janice your insight even further as some of you guys might recall i was the first male feminist that i knew second half of first year university 18 years old, so that would have been uh, beginning of 1972. It lasted for about a year and a half, and I left the philosophy because I could tell it was a hate and hypocrisy-based supremacist movement. Yes. Nowhere near as obvious and bad as now, but it was there then already, and that's why I left. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was not real, and if you looked at it hard, you could see it back then even and it's of course gotten nothing but progressively worse and more Amen extreme. to that yeah. yes. oh, just staying on the subject of um of men hating um that, that brings me naturally to julie bindle um, a, 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 a british a british lesbian radical feminist um who in 2018 did a did a did a did a, a piece or a, a wrote a piece um recommending as holiday reading for her readers, for her followers, 
Valerie Solanus's The Scum Manifesto, you know, the oh, Society God. of Cutting Up Men. This is this is the deranged woman who shot and nearly killed Andy Warhol. Right. Yeah. And she, her, I mean, Julie Bindle's whole thing was basically this is a perfectly reasonable thing to to be, to be advocating because men men have done such awful things to women. She also mm -hmm. is is I, I think probably by some way, um, well, she's certainly among the most prominent British turfs, trans exclusionary radical feminists. Although yes. I guess uh, J.K. Rowling is 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 more famous to the general public. Mm. But time and again in the mainstream media, I read art, including the Daily Mail, a supposedly conservative newspaper, um, articles by Julie Bindle complaining about having been cancelled. Yeah. Well, well um, cancelled as much as Julie Bindle. She, she, you know, even even when she's cancelled, she's um, she gets more exposure than the entirety of the world's MRAs over the last fifty years. It's really quite extraordinary. <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cancel, yes. just cancel all the way to the mainstream media. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> just uh, just by the way, Mike, uh, I took a um, psycho uh, a psychology of women course in the nineteen seventy four to nineteen seventy five oh. school oh. year. My ma my major was in psychology uh, back then. Uh, the first part of the course was taught by a female professor who I would say displayed animus towards men and even back then while there was no in-depth study of it or anything like that she made an approving reference to that manifesto and oh, her, yeah yes all the way back then and her take it, it it's the strangest thing it wasn't you know i'll tell you what it wasn't of course it wasn't that gee, maybe feminism has some problems because look at how much hate at least some feminists have. It was more along the lines, you see how bad men must be or otherwise a woman wouldn't have written a manifesto. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, um, the deep hatred underlying so much anti-trans activism is really cannot be overstated, I think. Um, it, it's so... You know, often I think feminists who have concerns about trans ideology have some legitimate concerns, uh, especially about how children are being pressured into making these life altering, life damaging decisions well before they're ready to do so. Yeah, it is startling to see uh, how, how quickly young people can decide after just view, viewing a few videos, it seems, or talking to their friends that, that you know, they want to um, completely change their, their bodies and themselves. It's quite terrifying actually to see. Really? Um, terrifying. But, but yeah, it is. And, and so, I mean, there, there, oh. there are definitely legitimate concerns about um, what is being done to children as a result of what seems a concerted effort on the part of educators in the public schools and influencers and activists and even some in the medical profession to encourage children to think of their so-called gender identity as fluid. It's quite yes. startling. It's absolutely um, amazing. I, I mean, it, really, it really is. About the one more thing about my experience, but there was a song I believe I heard although I may have dreamed it, and it was in the late 1960s, and I recall it was a song where everything in this young man's world was a male singer, like nothing makes every sense, uh, any sense, everything's all mixed up. And the lyric that stuck with me, and I've always tried to find the song and lyric in it, and I, I, I never could, but he sings, what's my name, what's my sex? And the point, as I understood it, was that if you don't know that, you don't know anything. You are entirely unmoored from reality. And I think the uh, the trans fluid thing, even more than trans itself, gets to exactly that point. I might know my sex, but it's different every day. So you won't 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 know my sex. But if you don't get it right, then you're sort of some sort of monstrous oppressor. And the whole thing, too, about 
it if you go trans you, you of course it's horrible to be dead named someone call you by your original sex name rather than your now uh new name of the sex you you've supposedly become so both both of those points what's my name what's my sex are exactly what's going on with trans yes including yeah including trans or particularly trans fluidity and i saw yes. a girl i saw a girl on youtube who was complaining about her parents or maybe even expressing some anger towards them because three days before she had decided she was a boy and her parents were still dead naming her uh, mm. so it it can get that extreme it's an attack on identity i mean this whole thing is an attack on identity which of course is the the fundamentals of brainwashing yes and they are tr making it so that children don't know who they are you know with the 72 yes. gender crap you I mean, that's that's what it is and what's mm -hmm. amazing to me is how it's promoted yes the schools are promoting this the american mm -hmm. academy of pediatrics is promoting this i mean yeah. yes. it's like yes. that's mind-blowing yes yeah it, it, exactly and if, if i might this was the most fundamental point that i wanted to make um here and you've just t touched on it tom um, it's identity as to who you really are. Uh, yes. That's so so uh, so uh, crucial. Not to quote our eloquent friend, or to quote our eloquent friend uh, uh, Janice here, uh, just from earlier in this discussion. Felt experience trumps biological reality, and of course that is exactly like correct as to what's going on, but it's exactly wrong biological reality ought to trump whatever feelings uh, that one might have. And right. as you're saying, Tom, with brainwashing, if they can get us to believe that uh, this stuff, they can get us to believe anything, it yep. seems to me. Yep, mm -hmm. I agree. Well, I guess one of the things that is so striking, I mean, we, we all agree that it's... Um, it's one thing to be an adult and decide that one wants to live as, uh, you know, a different sex, uh, as uh, right. Jan Morris did, right. for example. Yes. Uh, yet the uh, encouragement to children to to believe that, um, you know, at age eight they're actually something else, and, and the the obvious um, concerted attempt to make children think about such things and to. Um, believe that it might quite be possible that they should change sex or that they might be no sex at all, uh, some kind of intersex right. person and so right. many other different identities. Yes. Um, it, that, that it, the, the, these are very disturbing um, and they are outgrowths of feminist and, and social justice ideology. And at the same time, it is amazing to think that uh, various trans anti-trans activists cannot get past their hatred of men in order to talk about these issues as if they mattered in the same way to both men and women. Right. I find that so, you know, like to Julie Bindle is a great example. This is a woman who, no matter what the presenting issue is, cannot let go of her exterminationist level hatred of maleness when yes. she discusses these issues. I, I really, I, I find that quite striking. It's amazing. Absolutely I amazing. I want to talk if I can come on to, to two interrelated things, uh, biology and, 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 the, and this, the, the perceived mm -hmm. size of this issue. Um, there's a very good book by the, by called We Are Our Brains by Dick Swab. Um, a, a Dutch neuroscientist, um, and he states that male to female transsexuality occurs in one in 10,000 individuals, female to male transsexuality, one in 30,000 individuals. Now, I, sh I should say at this point that there are other, other people who put it, put it higher. Um, but the, the, uh, And he explains that the, the differentiation of our sex organs takes place in the first month of pregnancy, 
But the sexual differentiation of the brain only occurs in the second half of pregnancy. So you can imagine how, how, how you know, how genuine transgenderism, if you like, comes comes about. But it's but it's very rare. And he reports studies. This is going back to 2013, I think, his book, showing evidence of female pattern brains in male to female transsexuals, and male pattern brains in female to male transsexuals. Yes. Now, th 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 this, this all begs the obvious point that um, if, if true transgenderism um, is that rare, how has this become such a huge phenomenon? And I think the, the old expression, follow the money, comes to mind. You know, just as we have a, an MGM industry, we have an abortion industry, we have a domestic violence industry, we have a rape industry, we, 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 you know, we also have a transgender industry. And there are count, not countless, but vast numbers of of, um, of of doctors and therapists who are making big bucks out Huge. of this. Huge, billions. I saw a video the other day, Mike, of the of this woman who was a hospital administrator explaining to the doctors in this group setting how much money they'd make if they did these operations. They said $40,000 each. We need to think about this. This is the way we're going to make more money. <laughs> oh, God. It was like that's all they were thinking about was how much they're going to make, not thinking about the well-being of their patients. Absolutely the, incredible. The, the, the medical profession and the psychology profession, they should be hanging their heads in shame. At really? Really? Especially yes. the psychological profession. I can't believe people are pushing this. It's just, I did an interview with two trans men. I guess it was three or four years ago now. I love these guys. But these were guys who, from the time they were born, they knew something was different in them. And they didn't make any kind of physical changes until they were adults. When they did, it felt like the right thing. I've got, I did two videos with them. I loved them, and it was fascinating to hear what they, their perspective of things. Very thoughtful, very interesting men. Um, I'll put a link to those interviews below if people are interested, mm -hmm. but... But that's not what we're seeing today. You know, this lightning fast change in surgery is just so evil. It's just I, so I, I, evil. I, I, and you yeah, see I, what happens. I mean, see, after the surgeries, you know, a year or two later, people are going, ah, what did I do? You know, this is horrible. What did I do to my body? Now I'm a nothing. Even oh, those who don't I, I, have, I, I, who haven't had I, the surgery. I, I, I I'm so, sorry, Mike. I was just going to say, even those who don't have, have the surgery, but take the uh, very high Blockers, concentrations right, of yeah. hormones, right. uh, those have um, some irreversible uh, effects and, uh, and many are being taken in such doses that nobody actually knows what the long-term consequences can be. Uh, and to think that healthy, very young people, age 15, in many cases, are being encouraged to take those hormones, which will render them uh, sterile, um, you know, do all sorts of other things, uh, changes to their body, change their voice, pitch, you know, everything that, that many things that can't be changed. It's terrible to think right. that that is right. being encouraged in such young people. It's unbelievable. And, you know, most countries, Australia, Finland, Sweden, the UK, Belgium, France, I think, all of those countries have huge restrictions on this, huge restrictions. But the United States, uh-uh. Not restricting it. Where are well, in the we case going? Of the UK, Tom, that's that's only very recent. It's recent, they yes, got, yes, they're the most recent ones, so, but they're so starting to restrict it. Very so different from within the last within the last twelve months. I I just like to to quote um, Charles Murray on um, yes Charles Murray on childhood onset gender dys dysphoria, one of the three forms. He says this comes closest to the popular understanding, and it occurs in both girls and boys. It's characterized by behavior typical of the opposite sex from an early age. In the published literature, findings are that the majority, 60 to 90 percent, of children with this kind of gender dysphoria have become comfortable with, the, with their sex of birth by adulthood and thus have avoided the need for a sex change. Right, well, right. That, I guess that was true historically, but these days, a six, seven, eight-year-old showing signs of it is going to be hugely encouraged. They no. call it, and, 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 and probably probably will will not become comfortable with the birth. Of their, no, I think their, their the birth. research says that they will become comfortable. The research says that eighty eight percent of boys who practice what they call desistance, 
which I think means that they <clears throat> they don't change their sex. They just stick with it for a while. By the time they're adults, 88% are reconciled with it. That they're no, okay. I, I agree, Tom, but what, what I'm saying is they are now in a culture where the culture and doctors and so on will will only affirm that they are of the opposite sex. Yes, and mm -hmm. yes. The, the sadness is that if they would let them be for a while, they'd probably be okay all on their own, you know? <laughs> That's why this quick strike, this kamikaze crap of cutting people's body parts off is just insane. It's absolutely mm -hmm. insane. And, 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 and we see it, I guess, with the Texas, Texan father. Oh, Mr. Younger, his, uh, yeah. ex-wife. Uh, chemically castrating their ten-year-old oh, son. Did they do it? I I, I don't know. Because there was the know. the last I heard was she was trying to get to move to California, and if she does that, it's all over, you know. But he was trying to block it. So, yeah. Yes. He was even, even blocked. I, I know the boy when he when, when he spent time with his father um, didn't want to wear girls' clothes. Right. Right. Um, he was right. Very happy, you know, and and he was happy to have his hair cut short. Uh, uh, you know, and the female judge has now ordered that those haircuts have to stop. Oh, God. It is, it is it, you know, you, you could win. And if you look haircuts. at that, I think, I looked at this a while back, because Paul and I did a video on this guy, and as I remember it, the mother really wanted a female child, mm -hmm. that she only had boys, and she wanted a girl so bad, and this is a part of what's going on, I'm sure. You know, this, oh. Crazy stuff. Well, I, and I have also heard, and this is just completely anecdotally, uh, so take it for, for that, but that quite a few mothers, I've, I've not heard of a father, but it may be possible to, uh, act out a desire to have a trans child because it's another way of getting validation for, oh, for their God. own, you know, goodness and virtue right. as mothers. To have a trans child now and to be very pro-trans and supporting your child through their transition is a way for these mothers to get a lot of validation and attention from their friends, from the people at the school and, and everything else. So uh, a lot of, um, uh, I've, I've heard only about mothers, but yeah. uh, actually find this a way to um, get support for themselves. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, I think the fathers are more insulated from this stuff. You know, I think that's, that's a good point that it's the mothers who are kind of looking for the status, looking for the way to become, you know, like the group, you know, to be a like, to be adored. And, uh, it seems like it might be a, it. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say it seems like it might be a, a kind of version of um, Munchausen by proxy huh. syndrome. Huh. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I so think the men are. Also virtue signaling, surely. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to be sure that we uh, mentioned that Janice has done two articles on the trans issue. Um, one, girls who transition are victims, boys who transition are victimizers. And then uh, uh, Leah Thomas is the child of feminism. That was a great one. Both of them are really good and I highly recommend you have a look at those. On Janice's Substack, which you need to go join immediately. You know, you, yes. there's going to be things there you find that you won't find anyplace else. Anyway. Yeah, both of them fantastic articles. <laughs> Can you just put the last one back there, Tom, please? The last one back there, Tom. This um, one? Has, has the expression, a picture tells a thousand words, ever been more appropriate? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look yeah. at Leah. She's yeah. a biggie. Massive, towering person. <laughs> yeah. He must, yeah. Be, he must be twice the weight yeah. of those two guys. You would think so. Mm -hmm. You would think yeah. so. And, you know, we're going to do an interview. I'm going to do it. Maybe somebody will join me with uh, the researcher for, for exercise stuff. What's his name, Dr. Um, what's Jim's name? Nooner or something like that. But he's going to talk Nuzo? about. Nuzo? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, he's going to talk about the fact that even the biochemical consistency of male and female muscles are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Two uh, final points from me, if I might. Go ahead, uh, one is like, with regard to the castration of this young boy. I think Janice did a Fiamingo file or wrote something a year or so ago. There was a BC father of a daughter from a divorced or separated family and he had learned his 11 year old daughter unbeknownst to him and with that never mind with his not with his approval but without his knowledge 
was taking hormone blockers and so on. Tried to go to court to get his stop. The mother was totally supportive. And he was banned from speaking publicly about the issue by the BC Court of Appeal. And when he spoke out anyway to try to save his daughter, he was actually jailed. So things things are that extreme. The other yes. point I wanted to make is following up on slight pun, uh, Mun's, uh, Mike's point about following the money uh, to follow, uh, I'd like to follow John John Money a little bit, because right. I recall, as oh, I recall yeah. he was one of the first to get this stuff going. Yes, yes. And, and this one clip hits quite close to home uh, in a literal way, because his victim was from my hometown of really when of uh quinnipeg manitoba yes so so it ended up getting a lot of play there and uh, this is an illustration of the lie not just of theory but the lie of fact in uh, the lie about facts in an individual case and what had happened as i understand it or recall it there were two i think they were twin boys and uh through an electronic uh, circumcision machine one boy's penis got burnt off so the parents were advised to raise him as a girl and so right from the get-go he was raised as a girl and john money reported like oh yes the parents treated him differently his brother stopped tripping him and helped started helping him up instead and uh when he had fallen on his own and everything was wonderful and everything was good minor things here and there but everything was wonderful well it finally came out i believe this fellow's name this young man's name was was uh uh was rhymer and not that withstanding that intervention from the get-go he always sensed something was wrong yes Mm -hmm. Uh, and the most poignant or the two most poignant things to me was when he was becoming a teen and tried to use makeup. He looked in the mirror and said, I just felt him look like a clown. It just huh. wasn't him because he's a boy. Huh. And then when he found out what happened, um, he, then, you know, there was at least some relief. Uh, he married uh, as a man. He married a, uh, I think, a woman with two kids of course they couldn't have sexual relations or any child of of their own but there was a documentary on it that played big in winnipeg especially because he uh was from there and he you know talked about you know how his life was destroyed but at least he had this uh this marriage and stepkids and all that but he did end up as they say self-deleting ultimately anyway And, and this movie was going around lying about the success, even in a specific mm-hmm. individual yeah. case. Yeah. 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 That yeah. Was a and crazy in fact, story. Um, I, I was just going to say that um, Kate, Kate Millett in Sexual Politics relies very heavily on on money's uh, really? sexological expertise uh, Is that to, right? to claim yes to claim that uh, wow. research that he has done and uh, his colleagues with uh, what she called intersex patients proved right. that how one was raised had a much you know was, was absolutely <laughs> determinative of one's gender identity uh, quite apart from uh, one's genitalia and uh, biological sex. And yeah, it was, um, I don't know if it was all a lie, but certainly in that case, uh, it's oh. known that money lied about yes. the, the success of, 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 oh, um, boy. Of, of that poor little boy raised as a girl who eventually killed himself and his, his brother, um, died as well, um, right. as a result of, of drug taking, yeah. So maybe a, a kind of suicide or a, a death of despair, anyway. And oh so both boy. those those uh, the, the the two twins, who were such a wonderful experiment for money to promote his theories, um, they both ended up dead. Yep. So yeah, well, I read the book, and man, stuff. that was one of the saddest books I think I've ever read. Oh my mm-hmm, gosh! Me too. Yeah. Just unbelievable story. Oh, are we nearing the end? 
I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a huge there. topic, but it um, is, and there's so much we didn't cover. But we got quite a bit done. It's been fascinating. Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed yeah. being with you all today. Yeah, and, me too. Uh, uh, and and I, I mean, I think the thing that really bothers me about the the issue is that it is so difficult to have frank discussions about it. And it's shocking to see how the gender empathy gap seems to play out even when those discussions do take place so that we're not actually dealing with the issues, uh, all these prejudices about yes. female innocent victimization and male predatory aggression end up being superimposed on the lives of, of you know, people dealing with these issues. It, yes. it, that, that's really shocking to me. It is. It's a crazy, crazy issue altogether. And as we always say near the end, men are good. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy with four people, eh? And so is Janice. And so, so is Janice. There you go. All righty. So thank you all okay. very much. Go see Janice on the Substack. Go see Mike at his Please. site. And Mike, what's the URL? Uh, j4mb.org.uk j4mb.org.uk come see me at mentorgood.locals.com and Don we're waiting for years and we'll see you then <laughs> men are good y'all take care men are good as are you <laughs>